Uh, thank you very much, Mark. Thanks very much, everyone, for being here. Um, as Mark mentioned, my name is Ed Pito. Uh, I run a company called Outdustry, based in um, Beijing and Shanghai. We represent international labels, publishers, and talent going into the China market. So I've been there about a, a decade doing that. Uh, but today, really, what we're looking at is the sort of youth markets across the rest of Asia, or Asia as a whole, and, and a real panel of experts here to talk about that with us today. So can we just start by going down the panel quickly and a very quick introduction about who you are and what you do. I'm Esther from POTS uh, Worldwide, uh, based out of Vietnam, with uh, footprints in Vietnam and Thailand, soon rest of the region. Hi, I'm just streaming from uh, Spotify. Uh, I'm the head of uh, artist and label marketing uh, for Southeast Asia, and uh, I do a lot of work with all our industry colleagues uh, here on the panel in the region. Hi, I'm Vineet from Universal Music India. I do a little bit of everything as far as the label business is concerned. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Eddie from Rocket Film Entertainment. We produce some mobile first digital content, mostly for music based and uh, comedy, everything else that, that's cool, I guess. Hi, my name is Jonathan from uh, Trinity Optima Production, Jakarta. We are a label, also an MCN to, uh, for the YouTube. Excellent. Thanks very much, everyone. So by way of providing context for the, the panel today, uh, within a seven-hour flight radius of where we are now, there's around about two billion people under the age of 25, um, which is a great sort of top-line point to sort of start with today. Um, a 25-year-old today would have been born in, um, in about 1993. Uh, so we're going to look at a little kind of a cr chronological approach to this, because actually that same 25-year-old would have been around about the age of 12 in 2005. The numbers are working out here. Um, the reason I draw, drop it on 2005, and quite a, possibly a strange place to start this conversation, is actually the ring back tone. Um, because arguably you could call that a, a sort of Asia digital music industry 1.0. Um, obviously a lot of people here are very familiar with the, the, with the ring back tone, uh, but this is a very international audience, um, so I think people from outside Asia might immediately be flummoxed by that. So I actually just want to start by getting a quick sort of definition. I mean, so Vinit, for example, can you please explain to our foreign friends here what the, uh, the ring back tone is? Sure. It's a very simple product. It's a 30 second uh, sample of a song, uh, which you can subscribe through a telco. Uh, it is a product that the user does not consume, but anybody who calls the user kind of consumes that product. It was more used as an expression of identity, uh, which is why people kind of subscribe to that product. But it's as simple as a 30 second sample. And, and across the different markets we have here today, the ringback tone is in various states of decline or ascension. Uh, and actually, Esther, you, you started off in Vietnam, effectively as a ringback tone play. Is that is that fair to say? Uh, yeah, actually, in 2007, 2008, that's when the ringback tones really started to emerge in the market. And it really uh, took off for a few years and pretty much uh, had its, you know, death, I would say, maybe six years ago. And the reason I think it's interesting starting with the ring back tone is because quite often across these markets today, what we see is the argument of, well, will young people pay for music? You know, will, uh, uh, will you provide enough of value proposition to be able to say, okay, get some money out of your pocket or, or however to, to pay for music? And, and actually, strangely, with the ring back tone, we saw that people have been paying for music at scale across these markets previously. So Jonathan, for, for you as well in, in Indonesia, um, the ring back tone became a, a huge product for you, right? Yeah, it, it, start, it was started around 2004, and it's still about $60 million business right now. And even though it's um, slightly declining, but it's still uh, the biggest revenue for labels in uh, Indonesia right now. Uh, uh, perhaps a key feature or two key features of the ring back tone is firstly there's a payment system in place right so the pay paying relationship with the with the telco and also is you know, people cannot pirate the product so it's still uh, popular and uh, widely used and the easiness of to pay because we just pay the telco uh, indonesia market is 97 percent is prepaid market it's not a postpaid one so so just in this case study alone having a means to pay 
and no other option to pirate that product outside of that, people are very happy to reach into their pocket and pay for something. So, oh, and there's a similar example in India as well. At its peak in 2012, we had close to about 90 million people who subscribed to the collaring back to own business, right? Again, paying almost 70 cents to a US dollar uh, for a 30 second sample. So, I mean, from a willingness standpoint for a consumer to pay, as long as there is a product or a service that's available, uh, there is a payment gateway uh, uh, available. Uh, it, there clearly is a demonstration that people do pay for uh, products. I sure want to echo that um, the propensity to pay has always been there, right? Um, it's the challenge of um, collecting the monies. So at Spotify, actually, a lot of the heavy lifting is actually done behind the scenes, setting up the payment gateways. Um, and if you think about it, you know, from 2004, 2005, a 30-second self-expression um, clip um, cost you what 70 cents US um, but as we move out the value chain you know this full st full stack proposition of you know pretty much the entire history of recorded music that's available at a touch for less than 50,000 rupiah in Indonesia so I think the propensity to pay is certainly there is um, how we make sure that we can actually collect it safely yes because there's actually been a very interesting and really difficult transition from the ring back tone when things were pretty sweet for guys for a while. I mean, like in, in, in China, for example, it was a huge business. I mean, four or five billion dollars a year. Um, not much made it back to the rights owners, by the way. That's, that's a, the punchline to this. But um, that paying relationship between the consumer and the telco, as we move past that in the late 2000s, 2010, as uh, OTT services or streaming services or downloads started to arrive operating outside of a pure telco play. You move away from the payment gateway, the paying relationship with um, uh, the, uh, the consumer. How did that affect your business at that time? For us, it, it was actually a pivotal, mo pivotal moment for us. Um, it actually turned our business upside down um, in a positive manner. So for there, it was all of a sudden monetization started rolling in, streaming services really turned our business around. Um, artists started seeing that there was a way to monetize, to market themselves, to really launch products, not be reliant on other labels or partners. So it was, it was a big shift in the industry. And how about you, Eddie, over in Malaysia? So what was there a transition? Ring back tones were a big deal for you guys, right? What, what's the curve like, if you like? It's still pretty that? big. Um, I was just catching up with my colleagues, actually. They're telling me it's, it's declining about 20, 30% year on year, but it's still about 80% of the, of, the, of the market. So 80% of the Malaysian market right now yeah. is ring back tones. Yeah. OK, right. I mean, that's staggering, yeah. but but. You also have a huge problem with piracy in Malaysia. Yeah, we do. Um, we do, but uh, but again, ring, of course, ringback tones are so. I mean, you, you can't pirate the tones, right? So, I guess piracy. It, it, we were talking about this. I was, I was saying uh, there's there's this like Robin Hood sort of uh, a thing that a lot of these guys do. They'll rip music out and they'll put it up on YouTube, put like a, like their own little homemade lyric video to it. And I think it's it's these guys wanting to be able to to give back to their own little communities. You know? These are the guys who are in the kampongs or like the suburban areas, the rural areas, who just want their little community to be able to have access to, to the songs or to the content that, that's being put out. You know? But if you, if you look at it, right, um, every single market that uh, has a robust ad support um, model that is out there consistently across, I can only speak for the Spotify markets across the world, Every single market that Spotify launches in, you will actually see the um, online piracy level go down. You know, I think that is um, that is for sure. Um, so, uh, and in in terms of you know, again, outside of Malaysia, across the region, if you look at the entire kind of um, growth of the recorded music industry, um, it is accelerating. It's growing faster than ever, and a lot of it is driven by digital. Perhaps you know not ringtone, which is kind of in a sort of slow decline in certain markets, um, but in markets where we operate, you actually see a accelerated growth year on year. Uh, that's obviously to, to go into the piracy space a little bit now. That 
that's obviously something that is often said by a lot of people visiting here, inc including myself when I first arrived in Asia. It was actually a 99% piracy market in China at that time, right? So you go into that space, you think there effectively is no business here. Ring back tones were the only business. Um, I guess there is, there is this kind of dip, is, is what I'm trying to get at. There's a kind of dip as ring back tones kind of go down and, and people spread out across the other ad supported tiers, which is a higher value proposition in a lot of ways, but is much harder to, to monetize generally. Um, I guess actually a question here would be about um, that space as people pour out into the, the, the licensed uh, streaming space, have the advertising dollars followed into that space quickly enough to make it into a significant business? Esther? Um, <clears throat> I think in, for Vietnam speaking, because it's such a, it's a big market, especially for streaming, it's the fourth largest uh, video consumption market in the world. And so because streaming has really become the main way of uh, consuming content, the invent there's just so much inventory that the advertisers just can't keep up with the fill rates. I mean, it's so there's no way to see an increase in CPMs um, with that. Uh, I think one of the other factors to understand is that, uh, you know, why the piracy kind of goes down is also because of the development of infrastructure, right? And you look at India as an example. Today, with availability of cheap smartphones, uh, $30, $40 smartphones, uh, access to high-speed data at probably the lowest data cost in the world, uh, to uh, a robust uh, ecosystem of domestic as well as international players of uh, streaming services available. Uh, I think it's a journey f as far as a consumer is concerned. You know, The more the consumer interacts with the services and realizes and understands the convenience factor, uh, uh, I don't think consumer necessarily wants to pirate, but it is largely got to do with sometimes lack of options and lack of infrastructure that's available. And as the infrastructure starts building up, uh, then again, the way I look at it is it's a journey, right? You move from low end where probably it's ad supported model to you over a period of time graduate uh, uh, to a premium product. So, so I just want to bring this back to the, this is a, a youth marketing, uh, panel, uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do, I guess, is go on the journey of what the, the young person's experience is in these markets. And, and now um, the brand's being an important bit because it's a highly desirable audience for them. But just to go back to the, you mentioned the geo effect in, in India. And, and for people who aren't familiar, this is a giant telco that launched there in 2016, which basically crashed 4G data prices down to effectively free, right? Uh, at which point you had hundreds of millions of people getting online with 4G data for the first time, including obviously the new emerging young audience in India. Um, what, what do they do when they got online in the first place? I think it's probably a combination of things. One of the statistics that I recently read was that an average time a consumer spent uh, on video platforms uh, was close to about eight minutes a day prior to the geo effect taking place. Uh, post that today, uh, a consumer spends close to four hours. Uh, uh, on data. On data. Right? And uh, it's pretty natural to say that the consumer on uh, both audio and audiovisual platforms is, you know, kind of uh, uh, moving on to prominent platforms like whether it's YouTube, where they're consuming a variety of content, uh, or it could be social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter and uh, Instagram. Uh, it is also uh, uh, one of the things that we've noticed is that a lot of television broadcasters kind of created an app ecosystem where a lot of sports is being consumed consumed, uh, live sports is being consumed online. Uh, so I think it's pretty much the same what youth across the world does uh, as soon as they have access to data. Is it, so go ahead, Right, no, I was just saying, you know, from pricing point of view, obviously that is one factor, but um, at the end of the day, whether it's sports or entertainment, it really is music and content that's driving a lot of the adoption of the technology. Right, you know, without the content, without the music, you know, is um, you know, you you have a handset with no content, so that's really key. And speaking of youth, um, it's notorious that the youth attention is you know um, 
very fickle. It's, it's the hardest to reach. As our user base continue to grow, um, we're able to kind of really create that connection, whether it's you know, up to four hours today from eight minutes, uh, or down to like Spotify, where you know, the engagement on a daily basis is extremely high. Um, these are the, the so kind of premium brand association that we could deliver to, to brands. Jonathan, over in um, Indonesia, what, what is the young person doing now um, when they access, because it's cheap data in, in Indonesia as well now, what, how would you describe the new music journey of a young person engaging with content for the first time? Um, now they play, uh, they stream YouTube and um, the music streaming service a lot, but uh, mostly they, uh, they enjoy the free, free uh, the ad-supported model business, not the subscription one. The, uh, streaming is actually fairly recent in Indonesia. Yeah. And uh, actually, what sort of percentage is ringback tones in the Indonesian market right now? The streaming, I think, is about 20%, 20 25%. The 75% still the RBT. On a revenue, revenue basis? Yes, yes. Especially for the locals. But uh, we have a, quite a big uh, revenue for the international songs in Indonesia. What, what, um, what is the price point for a premium subscription on a streaming service in Indonesia? The subscription model is about three and a half dollars per month. Okay, so. and to keep bringing it back to Ringback Tones, what, how does the subscription price point work in Ringback Tones? Ringback Tones, the weekly rate is about 30 cents. Weekly, 25 cents the or 30 cents. The weekly rate, yeah. Okay. The weekly subscription. So you're doing a weekly subscription? For the RBT, yes. So actually it ends up being about, a th across a month, about a third of the price of a full subscription of a streaming service. Yes. But that's just for the subscription of the ringback tone. You then have to pay for the individual changing of the tracks, right? Yes, that's correct. And what's the price point there? Well, I think it's about 30 cents, yeah. As well, OK. Yeah. So actually, I mean, it's, it's in the same kind of range where people are actually paying for something that is actually quite a low value proposition as we were discussing a, a, a shoddy piece of audio that you never get to hear yourself and you're paying a third for that than you would do for a full all of the music in the world. So what, what's the, um, the difference here is the payment gateway side of things as well, right? Is that, that's holding things back. Yeah, but right now we have a, there is a, a big development because we have a lot of e-money players coming to the market and also all the big banks, they usually don't connect to each other. Like one of the big bank, uh, they have an e-money system, but you have to be their customer. But now all the big banks combined, they, they, they connected each other, so it's helping the market too. So yeah, for a long time, it was kind of pretty much controlled by the carriers, right? Um, but right now, if you go into Indonesia, you can walk into an alpha mart, you know, you can top out your subscription. Uh, you can do mobile wallet transfers, bank transfers. So again, you know, that's opening up. The, the payment gateways are all opening up, and that will kind of ease us into this transition. Um, it is still a very nascent state, um, two years in Indonesia. Uh, but with that said, I think, you know, looking at the potential of it, it's just incredible, absolutely incredible. There's uh, also kind of a trend across people being creators first, they're creating compulsively, they, they're expressing themselves firstly through social media, it might just be taking a selfie, and then they put a filter on it, and then they make it into a 15 second video, and then they make the video quality a bit better, and suddenly they're a creator, and they're getting traction, and then they're a micro business in themselves, right? So that, across all of these markets, that's a really vibrant place, right, in terms of the, the young people just don't differentiate between being a creator or a consumer, it's just the line is blurred. Uh, how do you work with those young kind of creators, Esther? Yeah, no, absolutely. Creators are now the young folks in, in the country. Actually, there's no difference between a creator and a class A artist, someone who's been professionally doing this. And so I think the line has definitely been blurred. It's now an equal playing field. Um, it's been very, very exciting for us to see some of the young creators become class A artists. Some, someone like Bauan, um, who when we first worked with was just an influencer. She had a few 
thousand fans, and now she's one of the top V pop stars in Vietnam. And these people are making a living from doing this. Yes, from from uh, the being a creator to some ad supported uh, content to now endorsements, um, deals, sponsorships, things like that. Could you give us any sense of a percentage of where someone's revenues might come from? Let's say, digital like online streams versus brand deals versus live? I mean, because this is a big thing in India, right? It's dividing dividing up where the business comes from. Yeah, so, I sorry, I actually finished. Sorry, yeah, sorry. yeah, no, I would just say that first, I mean, the chunk of uh, how they divide uh, those revenue streams and what they're used for are, are completely different. From a digital standpoint, it's definitely a market pr marketing promotion, serving your audience. Endorsement deals is where the, beef, the big chunk of their revenue stream comes from, and the live events is just to support their their fame and, and have that relationship with their art, with their fans. Uh, Finn, just uh, on, on this point in India, I mean, you have the legacy systems of Bollywood, which is still very uh, dominant in the market, but this new ecosystem populated largely by young people finding their personal expression for the first time. Um, what comes first is them creating stuff, building a followership, suddenly they realize, oh, there's a bit of a career here maybe for me, and it all exists entirely outside of, outside of Bollywood. I mean, how is sort of Universal operating in that space of discovering new talent and working with new young talent in the market? Sure. I think for people who don't know about Indian music market, it actually is truly unique because it's one of those uh, rare markets in the world which is not an artist-centric music market. It's always been a soundtrack-centric market, right? So Bollywood films are the be-all and end-all as, as far as the Indian music uh, ecosystem was concerned. But with this emerging trend, what we've noticed is that uh, so the thing is that there are only about 200 to 250 Bollywood films that kind of get released in a year and each of the film has a soundtrack. Uh, each soundtrack does not have more than four tracks. So what you're talking about at the end of the year, you know, for this such a huge population is about 1,000 songs, right? And we're seeing with more and more people adopting uh, audio streaming platforms or video streaming platforms, uh, there is openness to consume newer and newer form of content. I think that's where Universal uh, has created a platform called Viral, uh, where, uh, where we kind of give opportunity to a lot of young and developing talent which have got nothing to do with films. Uh, it's about their independent music and allowing them to showcase their artistry uh, through the platform. Uh, so, Jimmy? Oh, no, I just want to go back to the point about, you know, youth and creators or self-expression. I think as technology enables and democratizes their ability, um, one of the key factors creating is part of the process, is the start of a process. With that said, you know, I think Vietnam is incredibly exciting. You know, every time I go over, um, it's, it's just, you know, the potential is there. But I think what is um, taking it to the next step is really having a infrastructure in place, you know, the education of the value of, you know, the creative works, whether it's copyrights, uh, whether it's the value of a catalog in the long term. So this is really on us as an industry um, to really help um, set up the infrastructure uh, for new markets as, as young as, you know, um, Vietnam. And also in terms of infrastructure, before to be blunt, the real money is coming into these markets. What you do have before that money is data, right? And you're able to work, I guess, in, in your case specifically, working with labels and artists to be able to say, okay, well, this is where, you know, you might have only had 1,000 streams or 2,000 streams, it, whatever the number is, you're able to start saying, okay, but well, have you looked into this space or that territory is actually much more uh, vibrant than you thought it might be? And how, how, do you how do you communicate that or work with that set of data? That is an excellent point. Um, so we actually do a lot of work. We have a lot of uh, data that we make it available to creators and artists, as well as their label partners to really understand that, um, starting with Spotify for Artists. So essentially, it's a dashboard that tells you exactly where your audience are coming in, um, not just at a country level, but down to a city level, right? You will know your top 50 cities where your streams are coming from. You will know the profile of the audience. 
um, you will actually know where the streams are, whether coming from a playlist, or exactly which playlist, or coming in from your artist profile. So it gives you a really good sense of where you are. Um, so we share that with all our creator and artists um, to help them understand the audience and develop. This is really um, the artist and audience development piece that we do a lot of work on. Um, Sorry, just to add, uh, on a slightly different note, I mean, from a label and an artist perspective, one way to look at it is that you could categorize the customer into three different buckets, right? Customers who are willing to pay for content for, for premium products and services. Then you have customers who are willing to pay for experiences as far as artists are concerned, whether it's in the form of live gigs, going to their festivals, et cetera, et cetera. And the third you have is where brands are willing to pay on behalf of the consumer, right? Because today, uh, uh, music and artists connect deeply with brands. And for a country like ours, where close to about 650 million people are below the age of 27 years. Uh, there is a lot that brands want to connect uh, to their younger audiences through music and through that. So many ways to look at from a monetization standpoint, right? It's no longer just about one form of monetizing content or through one mode and medium. Uh, it could be through a variety of these things. Um, Eddie, in, in Malaysia, do you recognize those buckets? Yeah, we do, absolutely. So we, we actually started a show called uh, Namblas Baris, which is a, it started off as a YouTube show, it's a hip hop cypher show. Um, but the way it's evolved to become like a full blown movement or a platform almost has been, it's been very motivating actually. So it started off as a, as a YouTube show that people could just go on and watch stuff. And then what we realized was a lot of kids started recording themselves, rapping and uh, hashtagging uh, the 16 Baris hashtag. And, and from there, we actually discovered like five rappers that we put on the show and they've got careers now on their own. And then from then, we also evolved into doing merchandise from everything from your caps, your apparel to like water bottles and stuff. Um, and we had a free concert. We expected like 600 people to show up and 3,000 people showed up, we broke the door and everything. So that motivated us to throw a bigger concert and from there actually a brand a telco came in and sponsored it so that was that was the, the entry point for this for this brand to be able to come and give a free concert to the audience that they were trying to connect to it um just to change tack a little bit um, it, where where the sort of um audience is right and obviously facebook is hugely influential across all of these markets um but I just want to talk a little bit about the Instagram situation. I mean, certainly, I mean, in India, for example, Instagram is, is an incredibly important platform. Correct, it is. Uh, so when you compare it with uh, Facebook, which uh, it probably is one-fourth the size of Facebook, and again, these one-fourth, the numbers aren't small. We're talking about 50, 60 million people on Instagram. Uh, compared to what, 250, 260 million on Facebook. What do you think is driving that? I just think that the youth is connecting to different forms of mediums and expression. I think slightly older generation sitting on Facebook, which was created as a platform to connect for pictures and images. I think Instagram gives you that expression to take that a step further uh, by creating uh, interesting audio visual content and kind of connecting uh, with friends and artists and stuff like that. Um. Esther, in, uh, in Vietnam, what, what are the main apps that your average 16-year-old would have on their phone? I think there's two major social platforms. One is Facebook and one is YouTube. So we can discount the Twitter, the, the Instagram for now. But what they do on those platforms are a little bit different. It may change, or the message may change next year. Facebook is much more of a social, uh, let me consume my short form content let artists go onto Facebook to actually promote themselves, their content, where YouTube is where the actual content sits. And that may change with now Facebook launching uh, Video Watch, all of that. So it's, there's going to be some changes over the next six months. So, ju so just effectively buying ads in Facebook and Google ecosystems is kind of the entire audience sort of reached, right? Pretty much at this time, yeah. No, I just just think that the, um, the digital and virtual experience <coughs> and life is kind of really growing. Um, you can actually watch a live event on one of these platforms. Or if you go to a live event, you're pretty much on social media throughout. So the line is really sort of kind of blurring. 
And uh, to Eddie's point earlier, um, there's a lot of, um, at, from Spotify, you know, it's taking that Spotify experience into a live environment. Um, in fact, today we just announced that we are going back to Jakarta for Spotify on stage, uh, October 12th. And in addition to that, we're actually taking Spotify on stage to uh, Thailand this year as well. So again, it's creating a second of full experience, not just on a digital or virtual realm, but really having it on a live experience, which is really quite key um, in the entire um, user experience. Okay, so we're, we've got about a few minutes left, and, and I know um, this is going to be a, a difficult point to make, but I mean, having come to Asia a decade ago, and I was told that the Asia market doesn't exist. What you have is you have very, very high context local markets that require very different behaviors in each. And I, I, absolutely that's been true in terms of the political landscape, regulatory landscape, infrastructure, um, CMOs, licensing, all this sort of stuff. And obviously those markets remain very high context in terms of cultural considerations now, like what the audience wants to listen to uh, or experience. In terms of behind the scenes, is it now a case that the infrastructure across these markets is actually becoming more and more uniform uh, in terms of infrastructure, licensing, um, even things like data across the market. And there's increasingly what you might call an, an Asian music market, on the, on the back end at least. Uh, that question to <laughs> Vinit, Jota. Yeah, from an infrastructure standpoint, definitely. Because, uh, like I said, it's a consumer journey. Uh, if a consumer has to move to, towards a premium product, uh, uh, there are f basic things that you need, right? You need a cheap smartphone, you need access to high speed data, you need data to be affordable for them to kind of consume, then you need a robust set of uh, services and service offerings for them to experience. And the journey could probably be from right at the bottom of the chain where it's from an ad supported model to customer gradually over a period of time migrating onto a paid format. So as far as the infrastructure is concerned, once, once you have that in place, rest I believe is just a consumer journey. So Jimmy? Yeah, that's an interesting question really. Um, I think it depends on which lens you see it through. Um, as a marketplace, you know, I think the commercial part, a deal is a deal, you know, the compliance, the deal points, um, you get the deal done. Um, but if it's about communicating or messaging that uh, value proposition, um, through a marketing lens, it will be hyper-local, particularly in a, in a marketplace like Asia, where it's you know, extremely fragmented and hyper-local. So I think it, the key really is you know, through which lens are you seeing it through, for commercial or marketing or content creation. Yeah, that's and, and from the new generation of consumers coming through now, they're effectively being offered a, a, obviously a range of options, but ultimately the end game is one thing, and that is to provide enough value to that young audience for, to justify an exchange of money for a service. And, and do we feel comfortable 10 years from now that that is an achievable thing, that the young audience of today perceives there being enough value to make that kind of exchange, Esther? I think the conversation is happening. I think the training is happening, even though it's at snail pace. So I do believe it will happen. It's just a matter of when. It's not gonna be a hockey stick growth by any means, but um, over time it will happen. And importantly, it also allows the creators and the artists to make a living off it. You know, we're seeing it from the consumer on the demand side of things, but from the supply side of things, you want to make sure that a creators, young creators are able to, to build a career off their creative works, which is you know, the other side of the equation. Are you starting to see that in your market, Jonathan, that young people are feeling optimistic, both, both on the creator side and on the consumer side? I think it's fair to say on the consumer side, they're very well served with the different products that they have, right? But on the creator side, are young people in Indonesia optimistic about being music creators, for example? Yes, there is a lot of uh, young creators coming up too. And uh, for one example, there is a one creator called Raditya Dika. He started off uh, doing shows in his YouTube channel and 
uh, all of a sudden the TV bought the right and the TV make it a, a TV series it's become uh, a huge and uh, and also um, there is one uh, example where our president Jokowi interview one um, one kid from in the in the rural area and he said what do you want to be and the kid said I want to be a youtuber and it's going viral and so so it proved that um, a lot of kids is very eager to be uh, known socially and uh, you know, internationally too. I think just to add to that, I think 18, 20 years ago when probably I did my MBA and we were in college, uh, we never thought that there was anything other than to go and work for a FMCG brand or work for a media and entertainment company or some friends wanted to become doctor, chartered accountants, etc. Right? I was having a conversation with my 10-year-old uh, daughter's friends and uh, one of them actually wants to become a YouTuber. Uh, so uh, we never even aspired to have at that point in time, there, were, there weren't opportunities to have alternate careers like that, but today there clearly is a room in space for that. Um, Eddie, so young people in Malaysia, how are they feeling about that? Young music creators, how are they feeling right now? I think Malaysia is very, it's a very interesting market because it's, it's actually very segregated. Um, we're such a multicultural country anyway, a multi-race, multicultural. So the Chinese market is very different from the mass Malay market, which is very different from the urban market, etc., etc. So um, for it to be a viable career option to be a YouTuber or a content creator, um, a lot of these guys, they look beyond Malaysian borders anyway. Like how do you break into Indonesia? Or how do you break into uh, India or China even, or Taiwan? Like uh, I know a lot of... Um, a lot of the YouTube content that's being consumed in Malaysia is actually out of Malaysia. So I think a lot of the, the YouTubers are actually looking to break out into different markets beyond just Malaysia anyway. It's too small and it's too segregated anyway. And uh, just towards the end here, Chi Ming, so just to wrap up with Spotify, you're feeling like a, with an Asia view on this, you're feeling that there's a kind of general optimism across the region. Is that fair to say? Oh, absolutely. You know, I think it's so exciting. Um, Jonathan spoke about you know young creators. We do so much work um, in Indonesia, for example, whether it's from Riza, Toulouse, um, Afghan, for example, all young creators, young musicians, and the quality of the music, of the production is just you know um, incredible. You know, likewise in in Vietnam, you know, just the creativity is just booming because you know when you're in a healthy state of the business, investment goes back in. Um, the, the appetite for creativity, for, for, for risk taking is just a lot more and it's super exciting. So um, looking down the panel, I'm average age of 25, 30 or so. So uh, it's, uh, it's been great having just young people just talking about young people, you know. Um, so thank you very much to the panelists. Everyone a round of applause for the panelists. Thank you.